Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We are joined by Lindsay. This is our, I believe, our second in our quarterly swing bed series, um, conditions of participation. I know this is a topic that we get a lot of questions around, and this is, um, I believe, a very timely topic for discussion. We are a smaller group. We will be recording this, but we are a smaller group. So if you have any questions, please feel free to unmute or put something in the chat. I'll be watching the chat. Um, if you're watching this recording and you have questions, please feel free to email those to me. Um, we wanna be sure and answer your questions and be as helpful as possible. It is possible though, um, because conditions of participation is a large topic. We could get questions today that we might not have the answers. So we will definitely get back to you on those. But with that said, Lindsay, I will turn it over to you. Hey, thanks, Laura, and thanks everyone for joining. And as I, I do want to reiterate, you know, this is a big topic, and I am not going to try. I picked out some key areas of focus for um, today's presentation because, you know, no one likes going through a whole CMS manual, um, and it's in and, and likely you could probably fill it in a five part webinar series um, and really kind of get in depth. On, on each one of these, uh, you know, kind of key areas within the, the CMS manuals related to swing beds. So again, um, it, questions in the chat, um, and then, uh, you know, certainly we are available resource for you all, and at the end is my contact information. So we're just gonna go over a little bit of overview of swing bed, um, some general eligibility related to swing beds, and, getting a little bit deeper dive into some of the regulations and requirements and then have hopefully have some time for some Q&A as well. All right, so why are we talking about swing beds? What's what's so important about swing beds? And for, for some folks, um, this is all old news potentially, um, but you know, not knowing um, everybody that's on the call, um, you may be just kind of learning about swing beds as well. So we do wanna make sure that we we hit all audiences, but really, you know, a um, a swing bed program is really a, a great um, aspect of the critical access hospital designation, and it helps um, critical access hospitals, you know, comply with the 96 hour length of stay. There is a financial benefit to the organization um, through cost based reimbursement, you know, specifically for your Medicare swing beds. Um, you know, we're, we're providing a, a access to service. We're providing post-acute care, skilled care services to our patients um, or, pay, or, you know, members of our community, something that for some rural communities, uh, patients have to travel really far to go and, and um, obtain such level of services. So um, we are providing an, an, an additional access point to our organization through the Swing Bed Program. There's lots of, um, you know, ways that we can show our high quality of care within our swing bed. Um, we have folks that remain in our communities, and I think that's such an important um, aspect, too. Um, and, you know, closer to family and friends, um, it, it also aids in the, the recovery and the care and, um, you know, getting folks back to a, a level of activity that they once were at. Um, and then there's also been lots of studies, and I encourage you all to kind of seek out some of those different studies that really compare the, the level and quality of a swing bed pr program compared to a skilled nursing facility. So there's some, some significant differences between them, you know, from length of stay to discharge disposition, um, you know, and it, it's really um, a great kind of value add um, to your organization to understand the differences to really kind of promote your swing bed program. Um, lots of other things, you know, swing beds really can help prevent some of those readmissions and some avoidable ED visits. Um, and, you know, I think we, you know, we all know that swing bed for a critical access hospital is a, an important, you know, care resource, especially for our rural patients and populations. It's also a nice volume growth opportunity for our, our um, hospitals because, you know, for critical access hospitals, your acute census may be low. Um, and, you know, where you are not uh, admitting, you know, your IC, 
I, <laughs> ICU level patients, your critical patients, you're seeing, you know, so your census may be a little bit low or you're having to transfer out to larger healthcare systems. So really the swing bed program is, is the bread and butter for our critical access hospitals and think that there is lots of opportunity out there. And you can see from this chart here, and I know that I've shared this a couple different times, but um, this is uh, updated um, back in 2022 with the Medicare cost report data really showing swing bed utilization and how underutilized swing bed programs are in critical access hospitals um, relative to a target ADC of four per 10,000 population. So use that in the back of your head is, okay, if we look at our service area and we have a service area population of 20,000 people, we should expect and, and target um, a ADC of eight in our swing bed program. So just um, utilize that in the back of your minds, but again, utilization among, you know, across the U.S. in swing bed programs for critical access hospitals is certainly varied, but lots of opportunity for growth. So some general eligibility, let's see, why are we not moving? Okay, there we go. Um, and we're, our, in this presentation, we are talking about Medicare. Um, we are talking about uh, the Medicare as a payer and the, the Medicare rules and regulations around a swing bed program. So, um, other payers, uh, commercial payers, they have their own rules. They have kind of their, what they, um, how, how they qualify patients for swing bed, or maybe they don't. Um, and Med Medicaid too is also, you know, state dependent and depending on your state, um, there may be coverage, there may be not, there may be limitations, to what, um, how you get paid from those different payers. So for this purposes of this, we're talking about Medicare. Um, and so, you know, in order for us to bill and charge Medicare for swing bed, we have to have uh, follow certain criteria. Um, your patient must have um, Medicare Part A and have uh, benefit days available. They must have had a three-day qualifying stay. And, and I'm, this is, um, you know, post uh, public health emergency waiver in that three-day stay. So this is like, once that waiver goes away, this is what we need to be following. Um, you know, have a three-day qualifying stay um, in an acute setting. That, that could be in your hospital. That could be in a larger tertiary care center. Um, and they, they have to have, um, they have to have Medicare age or disability um, to have that, to meet those Medicare requirements. The swing bed admission condition is the same as the qualifying stay condition. So if they were discharged from acute after a three-day stay for a hip fracture and they're coming for rehab, our swing bed admission condition must be hip fracture. Um, the patient is, is admitted to the swing within 30 days of discharge. So the patient could get discharged out of the hospital, but then get directly admitted into the swing bed program if it's within that 30 days of discharge. And the patient's condition meets the criteria to necessitate skilled nursing, rehab, or a combination of these services. So I think in our next webinar that we are going to hold is around kind of therapy. And I'm going to also include a lot of information around skilled care. So we're not going to cover that too much in this. So what, you know, what qualifies as skill care and more information around care planning um, and comprehensive assessments that will be included in next quarter's um, webinar. Um, so mark your calendars. And um, just, you know, a few big key topics on why sh we should be offering swing beds. Um, you know, generally the swing bed length of stay is between 12, 10 to 12 days, um, can be shorter or longer, really kind of based on the needs of a patient. And, and if they continue to meet skilled, skilled needs, um, we really, in order to meet skilled needs, we know we need to have that documentation of medical necessity. Um, and there is no length of stay required restriction. So, you know, if you may have a swing bed patient, I've heard stories where the patient has been in over a hundred days um, and, you know, or you have some of these long-term swing bed patients, there is no restriction. As long as they are continuously meeting that skilled care need, they can remain in, in the swing bed program. Um, 
a, a patient may qualify to be readmitted to a swing bed versus acute. So, you know, if you uh, discharge your swing bed patient and they go home and they, uh, you know, have or need to get back into some skilled level of care, they can come back to this the swing bed program and not have to have another three day um, qualifying stay. And uh, it does not qualify as a readmission as well. Um, uh, and really, you know, a good swing bed program can be certainly beneficial for your hospital and referral sources. So we know that, you know, during COVID, we really experienced a lot of hospitals that were at capacity needed to get kind of patients out. So having that, I call it almost like that relief valve. So having that great relationship with your referral sources and knowing that you can be that preferred provider, um, for swing bed patients is, is, is great, um, to help them really kind of meet their and manage their beds, um, adequately and, and help with any capacity constraints that they're having or experiencing. So, um, having some of those great relationships there are, are really beneficial to your organization and your swing bed program. And, um, just a little bit of background before we just jump into um, some of the specific regulations and requirements. We are referring, and so what are so what are we talking about? What are we referring to? Well, Medicare CMS has a few different appendix appendix appendices. I guess you would say them. <laughs> um, one being Appendix W, and that is the conditions of participation for critical access hospitals with swing bed programs. And then we're also going to reference some information around Appendix PP, and that is your interpretive guidelines or survey procedures um, it, for, for nursing homes. Or, and so we are going to, to also kind of incorporate that into some of our overview of the regulations as well. There are, I just want to make note, there are no interpretive guidelines for swing bed programs specifically. So when we talk about some of the interpretive guidelines and the survey procedures, we're referring to some of the long-term care um, state operations manual. And um, I did notice that that was also just recently updated back in February. So there are some updates to that manual. So certainly encourage you all to refer back to Appendix PP to see if there's anything that's specific that we need to apply to our swing bed uh, program here. Um, and in order, um, you know, Medicare and payment under Medicare for post hospital SNF services um, provided by a critical access hospital, um, they have to have some, these three requirements here. Um, they have to have a Medicare provider agreement. They have to have a, the number of beds to not exceed 25, which we know, um, you know, you meet your, your critical access hospital conditions of participation. And then the swing bed conditions of participation um, on various residents' rights or patient rights um, around admission, transfer, and discharge, freedom from abuse, neglect, exploitation, uh, patient activity, social service, comprehensive assessment, care plans, discharge planning, rehab services, dental, and nutrition. We are going to touch on many of these areas um, in the next couple of slides. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the different um, conditions of participation for critical access hospital swing beds. Uh, as I just mentioned, you know, we're going to talk about patient rights. They use, and just to make note, they use resident resident, the term resident in the, um, the appendix PP as that's, you know, more closely aligned with nursing homes or, or skilled nursing facilities. Um, in this PowerPoint, I think I, we utilize patient rights. So interchangeable. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about kind of the financial obligations, advanced directives, specifically admission transfer and discharge rights. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about patient activities and social services. So you get the gist. Um, so let's jump into our patient rights. Um, so this is, um, so what I would encourage, and I think what I would encourage all folks to do when we're going through um, these different areas within the, the CMS uh, state operations manual is to to make sure that at the end, 
we may make reference to what we have in our policies and procedures and make sure that they're they're apples to apples. Um, we want to make sure, and, and so specifically to the patient rights, go grab your document that you uh, give to your patients on admission, your patient your patient's rights and services or your notice, um, and just compare, make sure that you it is compliant with some of these, these rules and regulations here. Um, and one thing that we don't wanna do is we don't wanna use the long-term care uh, patient rights and services. So we wanna make sure that it's, this this one here that's referenced in appendix W and um, here. Um, so, you know, our patients have the right to be, have a dignified existence, self-determination, communication with and access to persons and services inside and outside of the facility. Um, so different rights that we're going to look at, at specifically around your rights and responsibilities that the patient has, the choice of physician, um, how their their participation in their decision making or their decisions about treatment, privacy and confidentiality, um, sending and receiving mail, um, and you know retain in personal possessions, things like that are all should be within your notice of rights and services. So your patient has the right to refuse treatment or refuse participating in any type of experimental resource um, and to formulate an advanced directive. So. Treatment, um, really, you know, they 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 can refuse that treatment, um, and this is something that we need to make sure that is is documented um, as well. Um, we should not be, you know, um, uh, entering them into any type of experimental research. Um, these are kind of they have these are the rights in which that they have to can make their own healthcare decisions around um, and with whom they withhold consent for treatment and to make um, an explicit refusal of treatment. So um, we wanna make sure that those are captured within your notices of your patient rights. Um, total health care status. So information on health status must be communicated in a language um, that is the patient can understand. So whether that is a lower reading level. So again, making an important effort for folks is when we are, um, you know, giving notices and handouts and information and discharge instructions and things like that. Have we recently uh, checked to see what level reading level um, our, our materials are at? I know that a lot of um, a lot of electronic health medical records have um, really adjusted the reading levels, but even um, some of our our pamphlets of you know a disease specific information, if those are getting sent to our patient, let's just make sure that they are at an appropriate reading level for our patient population. Um, or if there is um, any kind of interpreters that need to be leveraged and utilized or sign language, um, we need to make sure that those are. Um, accessible uh, to our patients as well. Looking at uh, patients' rights and, and related to the financial obligations of patients, um, we need to outline for our Medicaid and Medicare patients in writing at admission um, what, what is covered and what is not included in services. So inclusions and non-inclusions of services must be made available to them um, in a notice on admission. Um, and they also need to have, you know, you have to have um, information relative to the their um, responsibilities around payment, um, you know, for Medicare patients having that responsibility after the 21 day stay for swing bed around copays and that they would be responsible for that. Or maybe some folks have, you know, a secondary insurance that would be covering those copays, but they do need to have that notice around that they will be responsible for those, that copay coinsurance after the 20 days. Um, in addition, I, I mentioned we were going to talk a little bit about advanced directives. Um, and so at the time of admission, um, we, we, a advanced directive. So need to complete on swing bed admission. Um, 
is the having the advanced directive in place. This is also important for if you are moving your patient from your own acute bed to a swing bed status, they also need to have um, their ad, ad advanced directive um, in, in possession or, or have that available. Um, so we just need to make sure that that is, even if they're staying within your hospital, it's almost like it's a, a separate medical record or a separate stay. So we just need to make sure that, that we're complying in that um, as well as it relates to advanced directives. So this is about, you know, the right to choose your um, a physician. So the patient has a right to choose which physician um, that they would like. And we need to make those that choice available to them. And a lot of questions come up, um, you know, that, well, you know, we have a hospitalist model and we only have one, you know, hospitalist available. It's any of the, the physicians that are practicing within your facility um, in that even in a, in a physician may decline, you know, um, caring for that patient. So we need to have that conversation with that patient to say, hey, our, our physician is not accepting swing bed admissions right now. Is there somebody else? Um, and again, providing that list um, to that patient and providing that, that choice of those physicians um, as well. It's part of the, the patient's rights there. Oh, did I go too far? Nope. Um, all right. So this is talking about um, person-centered care planning. So this is a, sort of a, a very comprehensive um, area of the conditions of participation. And it really kind of applies to having, um, you know, patients really involved in their care and patients, family and caregivers um, having uh, involvement in treatment and care planning as well and having the appropriate documentation in place. And some of that documentation includes um, a comprehensive assessment. And the, the comprehensive assessment um, is, is something that it, I would recommend um, not be done by, by nursing um, and not be completed all by nursing. It's more of an interdisciplinary team approach to the comprehensive assessment. And um, as well as the care comprehensive care plans, and um, they, they, these the comprehensive assessment is um, something that needs to be completed within fourteen days of admission. Um, and but we we do recommend that it is something that is happens within twenty four to forty eight hours of admission. Um, so I'm interested to see when folks, typically folks are, I would have to say the majority of the hospital, critical access hospitals that we're working with, they, they complete it in that shorter time frame, um, and take a interdisciplinary approach. The comprehensive assessment also needs to be completed if there's significant change in the patient. Um, so whether that be uh, deterioration in their ADLs, uh, any deterioration in behavior, ambulation, or health status, um, part of the comprehensive uh, assessment, you, there's the review of the passer and making sure that we're documenting um, a, or assessing um, a history of trauma. And we're going to go into a little bit more about trauma um, in a few slides after. Um, just to point out, critical access hospitals are not required to do the MDS or the RAI, um, that's the resident assessment instrument. Um, for the comprehensive care plans, um, it says, you know, completed within seven days. And I, and, and I believe seven days is written in the conditions of participation or the state operations manual. Um, but what if you have a patient that is only coming in for a five day stay? Um, for skilled care for your in, within your swing bed program. So, you know, we recommend um, that the care plan be completed um, in a time frame that's supported by the length of stay. So if you have a shorter length of stay that is um, a planned by your, your physician um, and we, we recommend having that uh, care plan be done in less than a seven day time frame because that that time frame may be too long. So um, you know, 
72 hours um, would be uh, ideal for most, for, for some patients. Um, the patient has a right for personal privacy and confidentiality of their personal and clinical records. Uh, we certainly know know this to be true. Um, we, and, you know, and but within this privacy and confidentiality um, uh, regulation here is there's also, um, uh, you know, patients must be granted privacy when they're using the bathroom and personal hygiene. You know, sometimes with our critical access hospitals um, that have shared uh, patient rooms or shared bathrooms. Again, we're making all attempts to um, allow for privacy and confidentiality um, in that, you know, whether we're pulling, making sure that we're pulling privacy curtains when we're speaking to the patient, um, closing doors, you know, removing patient from public view. So if we're, we're doing, um, you know, a, making all attempts for privacy and confidentiality and, and as part of, of meeting this here. Um, we have also, um, this, this here is around the right to choose or refuse to perform services um, has been uh, something that's been removed, but we do want hospitals and, and critical access hospital swing bed program providers um, who do offer patients the option of providing services for the facility to have current policies and procedures that reflect the policy that includes um, establishing an agreement between two parties. So, so this, you know, how are we describing um, this in our policies or our patient rights and admissions practice um, is, is certainly on who, who they choose or to how do they refuse to perform services for the facility or within the facility. Um, mail, um, so patients' rights re are related to mail and visitation and personal property. Um, the patient has a right to privacy and written communication so they can send and receive mail. So we need to have, you know, a, a policy or procedure around uh, the receipt and sending of mail. Um, you know, having, if a patient requests, you know, having something to write with or postage or some um, stationary paper uh, to, to write, we, we need to be able to make sure that we are, are providing that. Um, we have uh, hours for visitation um, as well. Um, and we have um, making sure that patients' possessions are treated with a respectful way and safeguarded as well. So um, making sure that we, um, ha we have the right, though, to limit any personal property due to space limitations within the facility or safety considerations. So it can, you know, somebody can't be maybe not bringing in their lazy boy recliner um, and, you know, we can likely refuse that there. Um, transfer and discharge here. Uh, so really, there's lots of things going on around um, transfer and discharge and, and, and the patient's rights. Um, so, you know, we there are ways that you know, around discharge. So, uh, I mean, sorry, around transfer, we can be tr transferring a patient if there is significant change in the condition. So we must conduct a proper assessment prior to any transfer or discharge, um, understanding if there is needs to be a determined if there's a new care plan, um, if we are have the ability to meet the patient's uh, needs versus transferring them or 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 discharging them. Um, if there's been a uh, a significant change in a patient's condition, such as an emergency, we need to make sure that a tr immediate transfer is is arranged. Um, documentation of that um, can be made by a physician extender, um, unless it's not something that is prohibited by state law. So. If it has to be an emergency transfer in that documentation, the only, you know, you have a nurse practitioner that's on staff, they can initiate that if that qualifies under your state law. Um, and before any type of transfer or discharge from your facility, we must notify the patient. 
um, or the patient's family or a legal representative of any of those discharge or, or transfers. So even if, you know, as part of our discharge planning of, you know, doesn't, you know, we're going to be trans or just, sorry, discharging a patient, there needs to be a discharge notice provided in advance of actually discharging that patient, whether it's home or, or to a nursing home. Um, again, that discharge notice needs to be made. Um, a pa patient's rights around a for, um, you know, any type of physical or chemical restraints um, that may not be required to treat any medical symptoms. They sh have um, should be free from any verbal, sexual, or physical or mental abuse, punishment, um, involuntary seclusion. So again, some of the behavioral and facility practices. So I know that there's been some, you know, a in speaking with a few um, critical access hospitals recently, you know, there is with the behavioral health patients. Um, and, you know, because of the, the limited resources that some of the hospitals have, they have said, you know what, we cannot um, accept behavioral health into our behavioral health patients into our, our swing bed program, um, just because we don't have the facility or the resources in, in order to, to, to risk, you know, to safely and adequately care for that patient. So, um, you know, again, if there are any alleged violations that involve the abuse, neglect, or exploitation or mistreatment, the timeline in which, so again, must have this within your policies and procedures, the timeline in which you must um, um, have, you can report this is, is no later than two hours after the allegation is made. So um, we, we need to just make sure that um, that that timeline is in place and it's being uh, followed. So activities. Um, so the back, I wanna say maybe it was 2020. Um, so historically, you know, swing bed programs, there was a, a um, Part of the conditions of participation was to have a activities program uh, for your swing bed patients um, and led by an activities director or somebody like an occupational therapist or somebody, a qualified uh, professional. Uh, that re requirement has since been removed. And now what the requirement around activities is or the expectation is that if a swing bed patient, um, it, you know, if, if there's something within their nursing care plan um, that supports, you know, activities, you know, we need to just make sure that that is documented and that is it is happening. But it doesn't have to, and nursing could be doing this, um, some type of, you know, activity related care that meets kind of their um the, the patient care needs, as well as taking into some of the psychosocial and um, physiological factors. So we want to make sure that your nursing care plan, you know, has the appropriate assessments, um, and that, you know, we are meeting those needs, um, that can be done by nursing, don't have to have an activities person, a uh, qualified professional. Um, it could be somebody thing that's done by nursing. You know, we get that, that question. I think it was, I just recently got a question around activities program. Um, I did learn, though, recently that some states actually have, and I don't know if Oklahoma is it in this case, but your swing bed program is still within the state regulations and so administered by the state versus following some of the CMS guidelines. Um, and so some states actually have had, ne had never changed the around the qualified professional for ac around activities. So they may have to still follow that as a critical access hospital, but I don't think that's the case in Oklahoma, but I could be wrong. Um, uh, social services, um, again, making sure that we're providing medically related social services needs to our patients. Um, having a, a, a qualified social worker is not does not personally need to provide all of the services. Um, required in that we've, you know, we've, our, as, as 
are responsible for identifying any medically related social needs and assuring those needs are met by the appropriate discipline. So whether that is uh, case management, social social services, um, social worker, you know, those are um, again meeting the needs of social services for a patient. Okay, so discharge um, and 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 that I did mention, you know, when we were talking about the transfer and the discharge, a discharge notice prior to um, prior to discharge needs to be sent to the patient or given to the patient and family, um, letting them know that, you know, we are, a, a upcoming discharge is, is about to occur. Um, and this notice can also be um, uh, sent to your state ombudsman as well. And it will check that box on that requirement um, related to that notification of transfer or discharge. So you could just send that discharge notice that you do give to the patient. Um, but what we say around kind of discharge is, and, and the discharge documentation is create a checklist and uh, making sure that we're meeting all the requirements as it relates to, to discharge. The physician should be preparing the discharge summary um, and, you know, there's, there's numerous kind of elements that a discharge, um, summary should include. Um, and, you know, there, the, and then another thing to, to point out is within the discharge. So whether your patient is coming from your acute bed to your swing bed, um, they should be also receiving the discharge post-acute care choice letter. So, you know, we know that a lot of our referral sources are, are utilizing the post-acute care choice letter um, that lists, you know, uh, nurse or nursing homes, home health agencies, skilled nursing facilities, hopefully our swing bed programs as well. Um, we also need to be, be providing that to our own internal um, uh, patients that, that may be going to our own swing bed program, they still need to be receiving that dish, that post-acute care choice letter on their acute discharge as well. Um, and, um, I think that was it on the discharge. Um, so rehab services. So if, if rehab services are a part of the care plan, and again, not all swing bed admissions are going to have, you know, rehab, specialized rehab services. They may be coming in for something, um, you know, IV antibiotics, which, you know, they may not be receiving any type of rehab services, um, but we just need to make sure that that is something that is provided to our swing beds if it's within the plan of care. Um, if you don't have, uh, you know, a specialized rehab service, maybe speech therapy, we need to have um, some type of way that we can uh, provide that service or obtain that service from an outside resource. Um, if you, um, and then specialized rehab services must be provided under the written order of a physician. So the physician will, will have that within their admission orders um, it, for uh, swing bed services as well. Uh, Dental services. So having a kind of a policy and procedure around um, dental services. And we the what's written in here and what the expectation is for critical access hospitals and within the conditions of participation is that we must um, have a, a a process or a plan for if you know a patient has some type of dental emergency that they um, are are to receive uh, dental care in a, in a timely fashion. Um, if there is any loss or damage to their dentures, um, we need to have something in place and, and for them to have um, the receipt of those within three days. Um, and you know, if a patient has lost their dentures, there needs to be a process in place for that we are um, maintaining their health, whether that's from a food and nutrition standpoint. Um, and then also uh, within this dental service uh, conditions of participation is also around um, ensuring that 
they have transportation available or if they need to make an appointment for some type of, of dental uh, service, that that is also uh, made by the, the hospital. Um, moving to uh, nutrition. Um, so again, assessing, making sure that we are um, assessing nutritional status um, and we're and we're doing it with a qualified individual um, and doing that um, nutritional status um, assessment there. Um, and so a lot of times, you know, folks may have a, a dietitian or access to a dietitian that can come in and do an assessment on our nutritional status. That would be um, somebody that's a qualified individual to assess someone's nutritional status or and, and kind of plan for their dietary uh, services as well. And the last um, section that we're going to spend a little time on in the rules and reg regulations, the rules, the regulations um, and requirements for swing bed services in critical access hospitals is around the trauma, trauma-informed care. So within our comprehensive assessment, um, we need to um, have some type of assessment that identifies trauma. Um, and, and that can really be just a, a question and answer, kind of a screening question, um, really to uh, identify. And, and so the intent really is um, to, if we do identify trauma, that we are not going to have anything that will um, increase the amount of trauma to that patient um, during their stay. Um, so this is something that can be done, a, a trauma kind of assessment or screening can be done by some nursing or within the social workers or case managers assessment. Um, and, and then we do have a few different questions that we could, could ask, but a little bit more about kind of um, the difference between trauma or trauma-informed services um, or, and trauma-informed care. So trauma-informed services are generally evidence-based interventions um, that really kind of help our patients and families develop coping strategies and process the trauma. So those are kind of the, the services, so services and inventions to help our patients. And then trauma-informed care, it's not a mental health intervention, but it's really kind of a larger commitment to an organ from an organizational perspective, um, saying that, you know, if we are providing trauma-informed care, we have built into our organization that we understand and recognize um, trauma uh, within our, our patients, even our staff, you know, employees too, as well. You know, it's, it's really, um, you know, organizations that have taken this approach around, you know, um, trauma-informed care, they've provided, uh, you know, a, a whole... Uh, so they've provided education and resources to help their staff members really kind of understand and recognize um, trauma. And, you know, lots of studies have shown, um, you know, that, you know, having trauma-informed care and, and leading with trauma-informed care, you know, there's great, out, better outcomes um, and experiences of, of our patients within our healthcare, receiving healthcare services. So what are some of the kind of key questions um, to ask, maybe, you know, patient-based questions um, around trauma-informed care? Well, we, we look at it in um, five kind of areas, one around safety. Um, and this is more of like a, an internal assessment on if we are providing trauma-informed care. Do we promote uh, a patient's physical and emotional safety? Um, do we maximize and build a client's trust, make tasks clear, and enforce appropriate boundaries? Um, do we enhance clients' consumer choice and control? And do we maximize opportunities to collaborate with clients and share power in decision making? And do we prioritize client skill building at every opportunity? So, you know, certainly, you know, self-assessing ourselves on whether or not our organization leads and, and has incorporated trauma-informed care into our, our, our practices. You know, um, certainly a, a 
key component and that has really kind of found its way into the, the swing bed conditions of participation. So what are some kind of lasting, kind of what are our next steps? We heard a whole bunch of um, information related to some key areas within the swing bed um, state oper or the critical access hospitals and swing bed provider state operations manual. Um, and so what are we going to, you know, what can we do to really make sure that our program is uh, meeting the requirements and um, is successful? Um, I would certainly suggest, you know, folks within your swing bed, you know, that are have um, are part of your swing bed team um, are stay informed and, you know, sign up for emails from CMS. Um, uh, explore kind of what's within the federal register because, you know, updates come out in the federal register before. Um, it also review uh, swing bed related appendices. So W and PP. So make sure that we, you um, are familiar with those. They have a lot of great, um, also some kind of operational or program specific, I wouldn't say recommendations, but it, good examples on how to interpret the guidelines from an operations perspective. And I think that can be helpful for a, a lot of organizations um, to you know, bring that back and say, well, are we doing this? Or if you have questions related to that, compare what is in the interpretive guidelines. Um, I think another key to success is really having a team approach to your swing bed program. Um, whether that in and that flows into, you know, the regulations related to your swing bed program. So each, you know, member of your interdisciplinary team of your swing bed program has responsibilities and a role um, to kind of uphold the policies and procedures related to your swing bed program. So, you know, if you don't have a interdisciplinary team that's, you know, focused on swing bed, you know, I think a, a big recommendation would be to, to pull those folks together, really defines their roles and responsibilities, not only for the, the you know, patient care perspective, but also from a, a holistic program perspective. Um, establish some workflow processes. So what is it, you know, for case managers within your swing bed program? What are their, their workflow look like and how they, you know, if it comes down to our admission process or our discharge process um, of our swing bed patients, you know, what, is, what does that look like? Um, and have a growth mindset. You know, I think, uh, you know, at the, we started the conversation around the importance of swing beds for a critical access hospital. And I think having that everyone have maybe a goal in mind around growth um, have some some target goals around growth because I think that you know from a long from a sustainability perspective, um, swing beds are are a key to success for for our critical access hospitals. So we want to make sure that our our beds are filled and um, have that growth mindset, of course. Um, and then education, you know, um, not only are you staying informed with some of the changes and or the updates or what's included in the rules and reg regulations, but even making sure that our competencies um, of our nursing staff or other kind of skilled professionals are are up to up to our standards, and whether that's um, providing additional education or coaching or training. Um, you know, there's, you know, say if you wanted to really kind of um, have additional education for your nurses on trauma-informed care, you know, certainly that is a, a topic that can be applicable to all patient care that's coming into your facility and, and something that uh, some organizations have, have taken advantage of um, really honing in on that person-centered care as well. Um, or nursing competencies uh, and education around documentation. You know, we talked a little bit about the comprehensive assessments and care plans. Um, those, uh, I always feel that those may be um, opportunities for improvement and something that we have to continuously uh, make sure that they are meeting the requirements 
um, and that they are are really the full picture uh, of the patient as well. So we'll talk a little bit more about that on our next webinar. Um, so that will be um, a great one to touch base on some more of those those care plans and, and skilled care requirements as well. Leadership support, you know, having making sure that our leaders of our organizations really understand the value of swing bed and uh, support that growth mindset as well within our swing bed program. Um, and then survey readiness. I think, you know, having, you know, at any time, we, we always know that CMS or a state representative could come into our hospitals um, for any type of survey um, or audit. And we just need to make sure that we are, are ready. Um, and so having building into our workflows, so going back to your interdisciplinary team, you know, the ability to have do some audits and um, be ready for any potential survey um, related to uh, the conditions of participation. So going back to um, reviewing some of those state operations manuals as well and the interpretive guidelines. And then lastly, really creating value. Um, we know that um, uh, the swing bed program is a valuable um, asset to our critical access hospitals. So how do we make sure that we are continuously providing that high value um, to our patients in our communities um, and, you know, really promoting quality and clinical outcomes, um, having a marketing and growth strategy around those core elements around quality and clinical outcomes. I think that's um, key to success for really um, honing in and growing your swing bed program. So with that, I know we have a few more minutes. Um, we can, I haven't seen anything in, come through for the chat, but I do have some time for, any questions. Um, and also, so you certainly can take yourself off of mute or enter in the chat. Um, we do have some uh, resources at the back of this slide deck too, um, you know, links to the different manuals that were referenced as well. Um, and then also a website that kind of speaks more to that trauma-informed care, if that is of interest to you um, as well. And then lastly, just my contact information. And um, hopefully if you have any questions, you'll reach out. I know Lynn, we always, yeah, go ahead. Um, I was wanting to ask about the screening process for patients coming into swing bed. Um, you know, the it seems like the managed Medicare or the insurances are, it's mostly managed Medicare, I would say, you'd require that they've had therapy evaluations prior to admission, you know, just to get them approved, uh, where standard Medicare, to my knowledge, doesn't have that requirement exactly. But um, what is, there's always kind of a debate about whether, who, whether all of the candidates, I guess, the therapies the everybody had needs to weigh in before a patient is admitted mm -hmm. and um, it, that there's that risk that we wouldn't get, uh, get it paid if it was, if you couldn't show that everybody kind of said, yeah, they should come is, do you have any insights on that? Yeah. Uh, so, so yeah, so Medicare Advantage plans, you know, again, very, they, they follow the commercial rules sometimes and they can do what they want. <laughs> and we all know, you know, dealing with them is, is a nightmare. Um, but I would have to say it's, it's developing an internal process. So if you get that referral, um, and it happens to be a patient that's looking for some type of uh, skilled care, and it's a Medicare Advantage plan that needs to have these reviews done, is to really have that leverage that interdisciplinary team and, and define what your admission process looks like. And so that referral comes in, who does it go to? Um, and, you know, some, some organizations have developed these checklists, some have in that, you know, they get the referral in the, the H and P and, you know, they can, from the referring hospital and they can easily assess, you know, um, this is going to need, you know, this amount of rehab and it's going to need this amount of, um, nursing services. So, the, you know, we can assess that from that referral information. Um, and so developing a checklist, so it's timely, 
because the last thing we, we want to do is have a very long, extensive review or a, a referral review process that we lose that referral because it takes us two days to get back to that referral source. So having ha, have developing a process um, that includes folks on your inter interdisciplinary team uh, certainly include, you know, pharmacy, the business office, because the business office should be the ones that are verifying coverage and um and having them involved in that as well and it's it's a very kind of quick review process um so some some hospitals again so i said checklists some communicate easily that they're not all going to be able to sit down around a table and review that um referral so it's you know communication via email um as well sometimes um they they've leveraged that is that helpful? Do you have a process, Lori? Yeah, we have, yeah, we have a process. Um, it kind of, I guess where I was thinking about it was around sometimes on weekends um, when there's less therapy available. We've had patients that have gotten held up a little bit make, on the decision-making process just because they didn't have, it, especially if it was like an internal patient, if they didn't have their therapy assessment done on the acute care side. And um, I just didn't know whether that clearance had to specifically come from a therapist. If you, if the experience of the other people involved felt like, you know, it was likely that therapy was going to be needed, if that's sufficient, or if we have to still wait for that whole like formal process, you know, I guess from my inpatient rehab background, we had to actually provide copies of the records that we reviewed to make a decision about a patient coming into inpatient rehab and provide it in the rehab chart. But I don't, that's not really required for swing beds. So I don't know, yeah. I guess I'm trying to explore that side of it. How, how far do we have to take that? Yeah. And, and it may be, you know, um, checking in with the payer source on, is it a qualified professional? Is it like, what's the definition of that rehab or that therapy review? Yeah, it's really more the just standard Medicare. So there's not anybody to check in with, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, the other thing that, um, does anyone else uh, running into this or have this? Um, I wouldn't say it's it, an issue, but anybody else on the on the line? Lori, let me um, see if I can see if there's anybody else that might know from a operational perspective. Yes, please do. And um, if you want to email it to me, I can forward it out to the group because that is a question we get from um, a lot of folks, especially around um, that specific payer that Lori mentioned. Okay. Okay, we can do that. Are there any other questions? Well, Lindsay, thank you for your time today. And I was just looking um, as we were chatting, I was, our, our next call is scheduled for May 10th. And so we recorded this session today. Once we get that uploaded to YouTube, I'll be sure to send out the link along with the slides and the reminder for the next um, upcoming webinar. Also, um, I preset all, well, I set up all the registration in advance on all these. I will not be touching the next one. There will be a waiting room. Um, we will not worry about that moving forward. So thank you guys. And thank you, Lindsay, for your time today. Great. Thanks, Laura. Thanks all. Thank you, everyone.